if you find yourself dissolute, neurotic, if your thought tends in the nihilistic direction and you tend to fall apart, organizing your life across multiple dimensions is a good antidote. When are you angry? What elicits it? Why are you angry? Who are you angry at? What are the nature of the angry thoughts? What are the nature of the angry fantasies? All of that. You have to get that out where you can see it. And you have to walk through it. And you can do that by yourself. I don't think that there's a better pathway to the shadow, let's say, than resentment. If you're feeling resentful about something, there's a shadow that reveals itself in two ways. One is, it's a pointer to your immaturity. You need to be more disciplined. You have set goals, hypothetically, and if you haven't, then you're under the sway of someone else, or you're uh, undisciplined and unintegrated and incoherent, which is all shadow life in some sense. You're pursuing short-term impulsive goals because you haven't thought it through. You're pursuing goals that other people have established for you. You're not pursuing any goals at all because you're too nihilistic to believe that life has any purpose. All that's shadowy, let's say. But maybe you have set goals and now you're resentful about all the work that you have to do in order to acquire those goals. And maybe that manifests itself as a broad scale critique of social structure. It's that's immaturity. And so you can delve into that and you can find out where you're still a spoiled child and hopefully take action to rectify that. Or you may find that you're being compelled to do something that violates your integrity and you need to stand up for yourself and say something that you don't want to say. And then you may have to learn how to incorporate your anger into your actions so that you learn how to say no when you need to say no. And so that actually means that you're furthering your ethical pursuit as a consequence of integrating your shadow rather than deviating from it. If you're without aggression and anger and incapable of it, that doesn't mean that you're on a good path and that anger knocks you off it. That can happen, but it's much more appropriate and sophisticated to note that the probability that you're going to pursue a higher good is magnified by your integration of all your emotional and motivational states, even the ones that can cause a tremendous amount of trouble when they're left to manifest themselves in isolation. You're way too agreeable. You could practice saying what you really believe, that you can take a vow to tell the truth. And that will make you much less agreeable. Agreeable people are perfectly willing to sacrifice what they know to be the case to maintain short-term social harmony. And it's not so much that they repress what they think, it's often that they don't even allow themselves to fully realize what they think. So a uh, commitment to the truth will stop an agreeable person from being a doormat. I mean, if you're in a relationship and a person is irritating you with something they've done, you might be highly motivated not to say anything about it because you want to keep the peace. You don't want to upset them. You don't want the conflict. That's all characteristic of high agreeableness. But once you decide to tell the truth, then if you're annoyed, you don't get to hide it. You don't get to assume you're right. You don't get to grab the person by the shirt collar and say, look, I'm annoyed and you're wrong. You get to say, I I've, I'm irritated about this situation and I need to think through that irritation to find out if I have a problem or if you have a problem, but there's, or if we both have a problem or if it's a different problem altogether. But you can't hide the fact that the problem has made itself manifest. And so if you're agreeable and you tell the truth about your emotional state, that will propel you out of that agreeableness by necessity. So... With regards to anger, I don't know towards what or how to get rid of it. Something a cognitive behavioral therapist might recommend is for a week, and maybe this is already a therapy you've been through, but this exercise is generally quite useful. First, you have to note when you're angry and admit to that, and maybe you have to practice that. So you have to decide, I'm going to 
pay attention, I'm going to see when I'm angry, and I'm going to admit to it, at least to begin with, without judgment. I'm just going to observe it. I'm going to allow myself to observe it. Then you have to allow yourself to see what angry thoughts you have. And you can ask yourself that. What angry thoughts do I frequently have? They'll likely come to mind, maybe many of them. You can jot all those down. Those are ones you're familiar with. And then you can notice when you're angry and you can ask yourself, well, what am I thinking right at this moment? What angry thoughts am I thinking? And some of them might be quite shocking. You might also manifest themselves in destructive fantasies. You know, maybe you have a fantasy of grabbing somebody by a shirt collar and pushing them up against a wall or dumping, you know, hot coffee on your boss or some impulse towards aggression that might manifest itself as a flashing fantasy and perhaps one that you're shocked by and don't want to admit. You don't want to admit to the existence of it, but you need to see what's happening first in your own imagination if you're going to cope with it. It's also possible that a fair bit of the anger that you have is actually useful if you could just find out what it is and what it's directed toward. So the first tack is to explore the anger. What gives rise to it? What situations give rise to it? What people give rise to it? What are you doing when it happens? And what is the phenomenology of the anger? How does it make itself manifest in image, fantasy, and thought? And then now you have an anger inventory. Is anger in this situation warranted? What steps do I have to take in order to become less angry? And sometimes that might be an adjustment of an, an internal psychological adjustment. Sometimes it might require changes in the world. Maybe you're in a relationship that's oppressive and you have been for a long time. And the way to fix that isn't to adjust your attitude, although it could be, but it might be that it's time to get out of the relationship. And so differentiation. When are you angry? What elicits it? Why are you angry? Who are you angry at? What are the nature of the angry thoughts? What are the nature of the angry fantasies? All of that. You have to get that out where you can see it. And you have to walk through it. And you can do that by yourself. You can do that while writing. You can produce counter thoughts. So if you're angry about something, you could outline the reasons why anger is not productive, or you could outline the reasons why it's productive and the reasons it's not productive for a full exploration of the issue. So then I would ask you too, if you're angry all the time is, well, are you depressed? H have you been evaluated clinically? If, if this is a major problem, is it a manifestation? because anger is an underdiagnosed symptom of depression? Do you have well thought through goals and plans and strategies, all of that? That's a more comprehensive evaluation of your entire life. And maybe you have something to say or do that you're not saying or doing. Highly probable. Most of us have that problem. What is the best way to avoid falling back into nihilistic behaviors and thinking? A large part of that, I would say, is, is habit the development and maintenance of good practices, habits. If you find yourself dissolute, neurotic, if your tenants, if your thought tends in the nihilistic direction and you tend to fall apart, organizing your life across multiple dimensions is a good antidote. It's not exactly thinking. Do you have an intimate relationship? If not, well, probably you could use one. Do you have contact with close family members, siblings or children or parents or, or, or people who are even more distantly related? If not, you probably need that. Do you see your friends a couple of times a week and do something social with them? Uh, do you have a way of productively using your time outside of employment? Are you employed? Do you have a good job or at least a job that is practically sufficient and that enables you to 
work with people who you like working with, even if the job itself is you know, mundane or repetitive or difficult. Sometimes the relationships that you establish with a, in in an employment situation like that can make the job worthwhile. Have you regulated your response to temptations, the alcohol abuse, drug abuse? Is that under control? I would say differentiate the problem. There's multiple dimensions of attainment, ambition, pleasure, responsibility, all of that, that make up a life. And to the degree that it's possible, you want to optimize your functioning. On as many of those dimensions as possible, you might also organize your schedule to the degree that you have that capacity for discipline. Do you get enough sleep? Do you go to bed at a regular time? Do you get up at a regular time? Do you eat regularly and appropriately and enough and not too much? Are your days and your weeks and your months characterized by some tolerable, repeatable structure that helps you meet your responsibilities, but also shields you from uncertainty and chaos and provides you with multiple sources of reward. Those are all the questions that I would decompose the problem into the best way to avoid falling back into nihilistic behaviors and thinking. <laughs>